Hey everybody, we're gonna get started. Uh, give everybody a couple more minutes. So my name is Gabriel Gadsden. I'm a first year PhD student in the what, YSE, uh, <laughs> studying with Dr. Harris um, and a member of the Biomes Committee. I want to remind everybody that Biome stands for Bridging Issues and Optimizing Methods in Environmental Science. Uh, so this year, so Biomes is YSE's flagship seminar series hosted by the Dean's Office. Uh, Melanie is part of that and helps us uh, facilitate biomes each week. So shout out to her and Joan McDonald. Uh, the intention of the series is to bring cutting edge research and new ideas to the YFC community. Uh, it is community source. All of our suggestions for speakers, including Dr. Hendricks, who's going to speak, uh, speak to us today, uh, are because people went to this link <laughs> and shared their ideas, uh, emailed us directly, uh, me, other people like Scott uh, Carpenter. Um, or coming to biomes meetings and dropping in names. So please do that. It really helps us um, and make it more inclusive. Uh, and with that, we're going to have Marcus speak in just a little bit, Dr. Hendricks, uh, and then do a quick Q&A for about 15 minutes. And so I'll turn it over to Faith to do Dr. Hendricks introduction. Thank you. Hi, good morning. All right, so my name is Faith Taylor. I'm a first year PhD student here at the Yale School of the Environment. And I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Hendricks today. For those who don't know, Dr. Hendricks actually sat on my committee when I was getting my master's at the University of Maryland College Park, which I'm so grateful for. And he wrote me a letter of recommendation to get into this university. So. It's awesome to just see my whole world connecting because <laughs> Dr. Hendricks is a, just such a great professor and really attentive to his students. And I took a class with him, but my course load was already filled. So he let me sit in, in his class as an unofficial auditor for the entire semester. Um, and I was just really grateful for that experience to learn from him even though I wasn't registered for the course. So he still was able to pour into me that way, serve on my committee, maintain that relationship, helping me through getting into another graduate school, another grad program, and he's here today. So I'm grateful for all of the assistance you've had with me personally. And to get into his, his real bio, other than his faith bio, uh, <laughs> Dr. Hendricks is a recently tenured associate professor of Urban Studies and Planning and the Director of the Stormwater Infrastructure Resilience and Justice Lab at the University of Maryland. He holds a PhD in Urban and Regional Science and a Master of Public Health, both from Texas A&M University. To date, he has primarily worked to understand how social processes and development patterns create hazardous human-built environments, vulnerable infrastructure, and the related risk in urban stormwater management and flooding. Other work has focused on technological risk, namely fertilizer explosions, and the cascading events such as wet weather events that overwhelm sanitary sewers and cause overflows, household backups, and contamination. His work emphasizes participation in action that uses methods including photography, visual inspection, and environmental sampling. Dr. Hendricks' research has been published in several journals, including the Journal of American Planning Association, the Journal of Planning Education and Research, Environmental Justice, the Journal of Infrastructure Systems, Risk Analysis, Landscape Journal, and Sustainable Cities and Society. In the popular media, his work has been covered or quoted by CNN, US Today, Scientific American, Huffington Post, Baltimore Sun, AccuWeather, and AccuWeather to name a few. Dr. Hendricks has received two early career awards from the National Academy of Sciences Gulf Research Program and the JPB Environmental Health Fellows Program at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. More recently, he was named as a 2021 fixer by the media company Grist for their annual Grist 50 Fixers list, and he has been appointed to the Springer Nature's U.S. Research Advisory Council, the U.S. EPA Science Advisory Board, and by the Biden administration as an author on the human social systems chapter of the US fifth national climate assessment. So there we are. Welcome again, Dr. Hendricks, and let's get into your amazing talk. Thank you so much, Faith, for that uh, 
for that wonderful introduction. Um, I like Faith's bio much more than I like the bio that I wrote. Um, again, thank you all for, for having me here. It is such an honor. in the spring of 2020. And so, you know, we experienced that transition from in-person to online together. Fast forward two years later, the first talk in person I, I've given in two years, I see faith again. And so, you know, what, what an incredible and, and remarkable experience um, to, to be here and uh, to, to be with faith and, and her new uh, graduate program um, here at the uh, Yale School of the Environment. And so, again, my name is Dr. Marcus Hendricks, uh, an associate professor, and I need to update uh, my slide here. Um, I just got notice about a month ago of my, my tenure and promotion, so thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, and so today, really want to introduce you all um, to the work and the research program that I've started um, since I've been at the University of Maryland um, with this title presentation, Stormwater Infrastructure Resilience and Justice from Unequal Protection Toward Leveling the Landscape in Communities of Color. Um, and within my research lab, I like to say that we take a social lens to what has largely been studied as a physical planning or engineering problem, right? And unpacking the root causes of issues uh, in terms of, of the impacts and experiences for uh, people who, who live at the social, political, economic, and environmental margins of our society, particularly in a context of stormwater and infrastructure. But before I get into the, the substantive content of my presentation, I always like to open up with a brief introduction in terms of who I am and how I got involved in this work to provide that personal context and narrative. Um, I was born and raised in, in Dallas, Texas, and hopefully everybody recognizes this skyline. Maybe not, I'm biased, right? Because I, I think that Dallas is probably one of the more recognizable skylines across the country um, in, in terms of, of the ball and the newly built Omni Hotel and some other really nice things that Dallas has done with the skyline. Um, Dallas is you know, within the top 10 largest cities in the country again over the years has done some notable things in terms of you know revamping uh the the urban core of the city and continuing to add to why you know it's one of the fastest growing cities across the country um however you know my experience growing up in dallas had a unique duality about it on one end i thought and still do think that dallas is one of the best cities to grow up in however my everyday lived experience wasn't quite reflective uh, of the things that I just spoke about. Um, and so, you know, the things, you know, that sort of uh, I experienced on an everyday basis and the things that I was consistently uh, disappointed about um, on the flip side of it was the things that plagued my community that wasn't necessarily characteristic of the city as a whole. I grew up in a low income black and brown community in inner city Dallas, an area where low wealth neighborhoods are overburdened with toxic and waste treatment facilities. Um, our black neighborhoods have more liquor and tobacco stores than they have access to healthy food markets and grocery stores. Um, or an area where women headed households are surrounded uh, by bad streets and they flood all the time and my experience growing up in dallas on an everyday scale was just that i was raised by a single mother we lived in an area where most scholars were considered to be an environmental justice community and our house was flooded on multiple occasions um, in fact the street that i grew up on specifically was a street by the name of stanley smith drive the street perpendicular to that of mine was a street by the name of prosperity avenue the irony right because you know there was nothing that was planned or built for our community that was prosperous or becoming for the folks that lived there. In fact, I would notice when it came to the stormwater infrastructure in my community, the ditches and inlets were always filled with trash and, and debris. 
and there was always pooling water surrounding these assets. When I traveled across town to other neighborhoods, predominantly white and wealthier neighborhoods, there was a stark difference in the quality of the built environment and their infrastructure. And so from that point, um, I really started to, to beg the question of what was it about my neighborhood um, that created these circumstances and built environment, not only for my neighborhood, but similar neighborhoods. And, and that sort of is fundamentally the intuition that has led me here today and that has shaped my current research program. And so at the University of Maryland, I direct, um, I, I founded in 2019 and direct the Stormwater Infrastructure Resilience and Justice Lab. And within the Surge Lab, we sort of focus our research within four general domains and planning between infrastructure planning and management, environmental planning more broadly, hazard mitigation and disaster recovery planning, as well as participatory planning. And at the nexus of these four domains of planning, we think about the effects of infrastructure on the natural built um, and social environment. We also explore the ways in which infrastructure can modify hazard risk um, and public health outcomes and impacts. And we've seen that in real time over the last couple of years in terms of even, for example, social opportunities for social distancing when traveling throughout your neighborhood, when we build three foot sidewalks that don't allow enough space for people to pass by without being directly up on each other, right? Um, we also think about infrastructure design and, and resilience in terms of adaptation and sustainable development. How do we endure and adapt across these changing environmental circumstances? Um, we also see it critical that, that civic participation, action, um, and community science and overseeing and provisioning infrastructure is critical to the conversation. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, grounding the work that we do in principles of equity and environmental justice in terms of the management of these assets uh, between procedural, distributive, and restorative justice. And so an example of some of the environmental hazard work that, that our lab is studying right now, we're looking into this issue of, of urban flooding. And, and urban flooding is an increasingly discussed phenomenon both in national reporting as well as the academic literature um, and, and this is just a chart from the web of science showing sort of how often you know urban flooding has shown up in the literature over the years between 1956 and as recent as 2018. Um, major U.S. urban flooding events uh, include um, some places that you all might recognize or have heard about in terms of tropical storm Harvey um, in 2017 uh, an event where some parts of Houston received more than 50 inches of rainfall. Um, total damages were estimated upwards of 120 billion. Um, there were 68 deaths connected to this storm, the highest number of direct deaths from a storm uh, in Texas since 1919. Um, an interesting fact about Tropical Storm Harvey also is that 68% of the flooded homes are actually outside of the 100 year Riverine floodplain, which is the boundary where we typically anticipate flooding to occur. Um, and so something to keep in mind, especially in this context of urban flooding. If you move north, east to the mid-Atlantic, where I currently live in the nation's capital, we've also seen our fair share of urban flooding events. In fact, in 2019, we saw an event where nearly four inches of rainfall a month's total fell in just one hour. Some roads in DC took on as much as five feet of water and more than 100 rescues were made and 8,000 households lost power. Um, but, you know, when, when I visit different campuses and, and talk about the circumstances or issues of urban flooding, I like to make it real for the folks in the room. And these urban flooding issues are pervasive, right? Um, and as recent as last year, um, New Haven experienced some urban flooding issues, right, where between Hurricane Ida and the remnants of, of rainfall associated with that, and the nor'easter brought flooded basements, roads, transit stations in New Haven. The National Weather Service reported in New Haven saw four and a half inches of rainfall, which is usually a month's total for the area. Thousands of utility customers went without power and schools closed or evacuated due to some of the storm impacts and complications, including um, the, the release of a, a gas-like smell 
um, within these facilities. And so again, urban flooding issues are, are not just limited. We, I know we hear a lot about larger cities like Houston or Detroit that face these issues, but again, smaller mid-sized cities are experiencing this phenomenon of urban flooding, not only domestically, but internationally. Furthermore, not only is it a, a water quantity issue, but it's also a water quality issue. Um, some uh, one of my recent op-eds and current research projects is looking at issues of basement backups and sanitary sewer overflows when these urban flooding and wet weather events not only overwhelm the stormwater systems, but overwhelm adjacent sanitary systems, causing raw sewage to back up into people's homes, right? And so again, it's not only flood waters in terms of quantity, but it's sewage laden flood waters. And we can only imagine sort of the human health, ecological, um, public health consequences of exposure to uh, raw sewage. And so um, as a part of a fellowship that I currently have through the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, I'm exploring these issues through a multi-activity project from you know, a, a systematic literature review to modeling the infrastructure systems within the city of Baltimore in terms of condition, inventory, capacity. I'm also doing in-depth interviews with uh, uh, stakeholders uh, around these issues of, of basement backups and, and flooding, as well as doing some household surveys um, and sampling of the basement walls and floors in terms of to, to make that epidemiological connection between sort of the exposure and the impact in terms of, of waterborne disease and, and flood outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the preliminary findings as a result of, of the, the qualitative stakeholder interviews. But again, not only is urban flooding an issue of sort of water quantity and quality, but it's also an issue of cascading events. In Houston, in the aftermath of Harvey, we also saw industrial sites that were impacted by flooding and we saw releases of um, you know, uh, pollutants um, and we saw explosions and fires as a result in the aftermath. Um, if you think about this in the context of an environmental justice community in Houston, the, the petrochemical capital of the country, most black and brown communities in Houston uh, are, are surrounded not by one industrial site, but multiple industrial sites. Um, and they also flood in, in the floodplain, low-lying areas that typically flood. And so they're at the threat of not only these sort of more natural environmental risks, but also these technological risks um, as we sort of see more and more of these cascading events. And so getting back to sort of urban flooding and, and the global commonalities uh, when we think about these urban flooding events, we know that rainfall is a major contributing factor spreading the impact of flooding beyond sort of coastal or traditional riverine flood zones. We also know that urbanization in terms of the amount and location of impervious cover uh, sort of particularly in high density areas increases the amount uh, and you know impacts the quality of stormwater runoff. And last but certainly not least, we also recognize that stormwater infrastructure um, is unable or are often unable to cope with the amount of stormwater runoff during these events leading to urban flooding. And stormwater infrastructure is where I want you all to focus throughout the remainder of this presentation because, you know, uh, amongst the, a, a myriad of crises that we're facing at the moment, um, we're also facing an infrastructure crisis at the national level from collapsing bridges in California to overflowing storm drains in Houston. A lot of systems are past their prime and decaying infrastructure is all around us. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers in their most recent report card gave the US infrastructure a C minus um, just shy of a failing score. The previous uh, report cards from uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers actually gave the US a failing score. Um, and so we're still in a precarious situation in terms of the quality and condition of our infrastructure systems. And obviously this phenomenon has picked up steam and has been well documented. Obviously the Biden administration announced this historic $2.2 trillion infrastructure bill that unfortunately has yet to pass through Congress. 
but it's on sort of the, the, the radar at the national level. However, what hasn't been talked about, and this is, you know, particularly for anybody that studies environmental hazards or disasters, with any type of crisis or disaster, social stratification is inherent, right? In terms of who is the most impacted and who suffers the most, not only in terms of exposure, but the ability to effectively respond and recover from these types of crises and disasters. However, little to no attention has been paid to where and on whom the burdens of this decaying infrastructure fall heaviest. And that's where I point us to two bodies of scholarship where we might lean on to understand sort of who suffers the most and, and who bears the brunt of these multiple crises, specifically this infrastructure crises. The environmental justice literature is one body of literature that talks about how the nation's environmental laws, regulations, policies haven't been applied fairly across all segments of the population. A complementary body of literature is social vulnerability to disaster, who talks about uh, social stratification along the lines of race, income, ability, gender, age, nationality, among other features contribute to differential risk and impacts from disasters. Um, when it comes to selected mentions of infrastructure across these two bodies of literature, Dr. Robert Bullard in 94 charged the nation to redefine environment to include infrastructure. Shannon Van Zandt in 2012 uh, talked about how infrastructure can modify vulnerabilities and risk. Dr. Sokovi Wilson in 2008 talked about the failure of municipalities to install up to code sewer and water infrastructure can lead to vulnerabilities in these systems, particularly among poor people of color residents. And so what we have here are these larger social processes at play between historic redlining and racial zoning, uh, contemporary chronic unemployment, substandard housing, poverty, discrimination, and ongoing economic disinvestment that have direct consequences for these infrastructural processes in terms of the inventory condition, distribution of infrastructure systems at the local level, as well as, uh, you know, even the, the material or equipment that's used for these various systems, um, as well as the maintenance and rehabilitation decision trees in terms of how public works departments respond and where they fund and invest in different systems in terms of maintenance and rehabilitation. And I unpack sort of this phenomenon more in a piece that I published last year. I'm entitled Unequal Protection Revisited, Planning for Environmental Justice, Hazard Vulnerability and Critical Infrastructure in Communities of Color, and talk about how environmental justice as a body of literature and social vulnerability can complement one another, uh, particularly in the context of infrastructure in terms of how uh, communities of color over the years have been underserved or unserved altogether, which has led to uh, a decaying built environment that puts them at risk of, of some of these environmental and other type of, of climate induced hazard risk events um, in terms of stormwater systems and flooding. At the end uh, of this piece, I present a, a conceptual framework by which we can understand a relationship between um, variables uh, that we think about when it comes to social vulnerability and environmental justice and how those things lead to neighborhood factors and inequalities that again have direct consequences in terms of, of physical vulnerability and critical infrastructure systems that inevitably have uh, connections to hazard risk exposure recovery between natural climate induced events environmental technological and public health and I want to pause here and say that although we associate race, ethnicity, class, gender with issues of vulnerability and environmental injustice, that Black folks and poor folks aren't inherently vulnerable, right? That there are these larger processes and phenomena of racism, classism, sexism, that again, systematically corner people into these precarious situations. And we have to be clear and explicit about that in terms of in fact, how these circumstances uh, actually manifest and occur. And so what does the application of this framework look like um, if we take a, a, a trip, you know, about 300 miles south of New Haven to um, our current city of Washington, D.C., um, the nation's capital, a population a little over 700,000 people, 
um, a, a place located on the northern shore of the Potomac River um, and the Anacostia and borders both the states of Maryland and Virginia. DC receives somewhere around 40 inches of precipitation annually across a 60 mile a square mile area. Um, and again, DC has had its fair share of disaster scenarios between the 2019 flash floods that I mentioned um, and 2020, um, some, some heavy rainfalls and flooding. And so again, sort of a, a coastal area that also experiences every type of flood scenarios between coastal storm surge, riverine, as well as pluvial events and, and rainfall. Um, and so, you know, the, the importance of stormwater infrastructure for DC, just like many other cis, uh, cities, it, is critical. And so when it comes to the specific types of uh, stormwater systems located in uh, DC, DC has two types of systems, what we call an MS4, which is a separate storm sewer system, meaning that they have two different pipe network systems, one that manages uh, stormwater and one that manages wastewater or sanitation. Um, and then a combined sewer system is a system where it's one pipe network that manages both stormwater as well as wastewater. The interesting thing about DC is that DC has a combination of MS4 separated pipes as well as some combined uh, systems. And, and, you, and maybe New Haven also has some combination um, because a lot of, of, of mid-Atlantic and northeastern um, areas that you know were populated first at the inception of this country um, started off with these combined systems. Obviously, over time, as we realized um, the environmental health impacts of had, of managing sanitation or sewage and stormwater had ecological consequences. As we moved westward, we started to develop these MS4 systems in terms of the management of, of storm and wastewater. When it comes to my research program. We explore impacts and issues both above ground and below ground. We look at the impacts of failing systems and flooding in terms of the parcels and the building structures, but then we also look at, at the issues of the pipes in terms of inventory condition distribution. I also have a project where we have, um, where we have sensors installed at what we call outfalls that's monitoring sort of uh, the, the water quantity and quality as it runs across um, you know, the surface level and, and what it looks like as it's being deposited into local bodies of water. And so again, my lab and, and research group is addressing issues are comprehensively when it comes to infrastructure and flooding. And so two core research questions related to the program. Uh, what is the general inventory in terms of type and location of various infrastructure systems, specifically stormwater? And what's the context in terms of siting and design of these systems? Furthermore, how do social variables associated with environmental justice and social vulnerability between race, class, ethnicity drive the inventory condition and distribution of these systems at the neighborhood level? And so if you look at this map of DC, uh, the polygons in the background, the grayscale is showing the distribution of socially vulnerable neighborhoods. You can really cut the district in half at, at a diagonal angle in terms of where socially vulnerable communities are located and where affluent non-social vulnerable and predominantly white communities are located. In fact, uh, you know, over the years, this part of DC, North and Southeast DC, east of the Anacostia, has been hyper concentrated as DC has gentrified. Um, and so this area is hyper concentrated with, with low wealth um, and, and black individuals. Um, and then the circles are showing uh, the, the pipe, the size, uh, the amount of pipe length in terms of the gray pipe infrastructure for stormwater. And so the smaller circles show less pipe length uh, in these areas and the larger circles show more pipe length. And it's kind of hard to see, but you can start to see some of the patterns in terms of some larger circles clustered in the lighter shades of gray and a lot more smaller circles in the darker shades of gray in terms of the distribution of these systems. Obviously, you all, we know as academic scientists and scholars, we can't absolutely depend on a map. And so we have to test these things empirically in terms of, of statistics and modeling. And so 
you know, between uh, the two multivariate regression models that me and my students ran, we were able to empirically show that uh, as the uh, amount of social vulnerability in terms of, of this index increases, uh, less pipe length in terms of the amount of pipes uh, we can expect on average in these same areas. Something also interesting, if you look at impervious rate, we also see that as uh, the uh, as the amount of impervious cover increases, that there's a reduction in the uh, the amount uh, of pipe length and pipe capacity available. And so, how do we interpret that? It's interesting because it seems as though as the District of Columbia has continued to urbanize and develop above ground over the years. The stormwater infrastructure below ground hasn't kept pace with the amount of development above ground, right? And so we know impervious surfaces increases stormwater runoff. However, uh, we haven't sufficiently supplied stormwater systems to deal with that increasing stormwater runoff. And obviously that's problematic, especially um, when we're talking about socially vulnerable communities that already face a number of risks. Um, and so this other sort of model, one model shows pipe length, the other model shows pipe area in terms of uh, the capacity of these pipelines. Um, and we see some of the same outcomes in terms of socially vulnerable communities having less pipe length and uh, pipe capacity. I also tell, you know, my students that, you know, the numbers and, and quantitative, you know, scholarship tells only a part of the story, right? And so I like to consider myself as a, as a mixed method scholar who engages in both quantitative and qualitative research. And so just a, as another example of some of, uh, of the work that we're doing in the area um, and taking a qualitative approach to understanding basement backups and overflows in the city of Baltimore, just north of DC. And so I want to share with you all some of the preliminary findings from the in-depth stakeholder interviews that I've been engaged with, um, with local uh, public works officials, community organizers, state officials with the Department of the Environment for the state of Maryland, as well as EPA officials who have been engaged uh, with some of the consent decrees uh, with the Baltimore uh, sanitary sewer overflow um, incidents. And so one of the preliminary themes out of, out of my research and, and interviews is that we have in Baltimore a legally permitted demarcation for a physically interconnected system. Dr. Hendricks, what does that mean? It means that we have an invisible legal line that separates the public right away from the private property side. And when it comes to infrastructure, the city will not engage with infrastructure that technically falls across that invisible line. And so when we have failures or collapses in the system that causes these backups and overflows, if it technically falls on a private property side, the city won't engage or provide support or funding for that system. Why is it an issue? Because these systems are inherently interconnected and interdependent and stress uh, and collapses on one side of the system have direct consequences for the other side of the system, despite this invisible, invisible property line. And so one of the challenges and, and some of the things that I write up and, and talk about, you know, in, in my book proposal that I'm writing, as well as some other um, publications is that we have to figure out how can we address this infrastructure crisis um, despite sort of the, this legal permit line. Um, and in some of my conversations with my EPA colleagues, there is precedent um, in terms of state, local, federal intervention across the private property line in terms of uh, Flint, Michigan and, and the drinking water issue um, and it getting so bad to where it requires state and federal intervention across or on the private property side. And so one of my arguments is that, that there's an opportunity for the same level of intervention when it comes to sanitary and wastewater systems. Another theme is that, you know, when it comes to the Clean Water Act, there's explicit language that details that it's illegal to discharge in habitats in terms of the Chesapeake Bay or other local bodies of water, but we don't have explicit language for uh, illicit discharge when it comes to people's homes and the built environment. And so how do we arrive at this place where we draft federal historic legislation decades ago, ago in terms of the Clean Water Act that is protecting the natural environment, but doesn't protect people uh, equally, right? And so 
um, there's an issue in terms of we might need to revisit this policy um, and, and make sure that we have explicit language in terms of illicit discharge, not only for local waterways and natural habitats, but also people's homes, um, because when it's, when it's implicit or not explicit, um, folks use that to get around and say, oh, well, it's not our responsibility when we have illicit discharge in people's homes because it's not clearly outlined in terms of the legislation that sort of oversees these types of issues. Another preliminary thing is that, you know, there's what I'm calling this stigma of stink in terms of me engaging with communities and households that have experienced these backups. And I've had a challenge of having folks to come forward about these issues is because who wants to sort of publicly disclose that they currently have or in the recent past have had raw sewage in their home. Um, and so there's this stigma around it, but obviously, you know, without people vocalizing these issues, it's hard to get momentum and people to step up to address these issues. And so I'm actively working to find a balance between being sensitive and encouraging residents to come forward about these issues so that they can be addressed once and for all. And then lastly, uh, in terms of these things is that there's a disconnect between the 311 operator and the Department of Public Works programs and services. And so, you know, the Department of Public Works has this silly policy that within 24 hours of a backup or overflow incident, in order for them to support, the resident has to call within 24 hours and report the issue. The challenge is, is one, if you have flooding and raw sewage in your home that displaces you or it's a lot going on, you may not be thinking to call this particular program um, uh, through 311 to DPW to, to get these issues. You're gonna try to immediately address it yourself. And so that 24 hour time period passes quickly. But the additional challenge is, is that for the folks who are aware that they have a 24 hour time period and do call 311, the 311 operator doesn't even know what the programs and services that are available related to the sanitary sewer overflows and basement backups. And so, you know, I thought it was clever. I had the no service because when people call, they literally get no service in terms of these basement backups and overflows because the, the 311 operators are, are completely unaware of these specific programs to help uh, support residents and communities with these issues. And so in closing, um, I, I just want to sort of highlight some of the connected and tangential work that I've done over the years and, and some of my publications. Um, when I was meeting and having dinner with the students yesterday, I mentioned that it is not good enough for me to sort of uh, do empirical secondary quantitative work and publish and get famous and, and then, you know, communities that, that uh, I care about are still catching hell, right? And so I want to actively sort of exchange capacity. And I don't like using the, the phrase capacity building because it makes it seem as though it's a top down one, you know, uh, one side approach. I think there's an opportunity for us to learn a tremendous amount of, of knowledge and information from communities and individuals that live in these communities that endure circumstances um, every single day. And so as an extension of my early dissertation work in Houston, um, I also developed a participatory assessment technique for infrastructure, um, a technique by which I mobilized community residents as community scientists to do visual inspections of their infrastructure systems comparable to the approaches that trained engineers at the city take to evaluate infrastructure. Um, and I also recognize early on that when it comes to, uh, you know, community science, there's this additional burden. We talk about burdens of exposure, but there's also this burden of proof that, you know, marginalized communities deal with in terms of having to prove that, in fact, they experience what they say they experience. And then when they're actively sort of collecting data through a vetted technique to demonstrate that they're experiencing what they say they experience, they, uh, folks push back and say, oh, well, the quality of the data in terms of validity and reliability isn't there. And so I said, fine, I'll address this issue head on. And so I partnered with some of my colleagues who are engineers and we set up an experiment by which we tested the data uh, derived from community scientists against trained engineers as well as LIDAR technology. And we were able to show that there wasn't a statistically significant difference in the quality of data across these three different groups. And so 
through proper training and just with a little amount of time, because this isn't rocket science, right? Rocket science is rocket science. This isn't that, right? Um, that everyday folks without degrees, uh, you know, without technical certifications can engage in this type of work, especially when they witness and engage with this infrastructure every single day and understand dynamics that we can't necessarily anticipate or preview from you know, our, our offices or our laboratories. And so this paper demonstrates again that there's not a difference and this community science data can in fact be valid and reliable. Another paper uh, that I published, you know, takes it a step further to, to say that, you know, oftentimes when it comes to, you know, adaptation planning and the redevelopment of community spaces, marginalized groups aren't engaged in these processes. Um, and so things are done to them or things are underway. Um, they're gentrified and it's a whirlwind and, and nobody knew what happened. Well, people knew what happened, but it was, it was done sort of in an insidious way, right? And so um, uh, another sort of project and, and paper that uh, you know, I led was this process where we partner with an environmental justice community and we developed a grassroots master plan that included stormwater infrastructure interventions, both gray and green infrastructure, um, to sort of, again, develop a plan that was reflective of the ideas and the needs and wants of the community, right, through a genuine partnership. But not only did we develop this master plan, but mo what's most often left out of these conversations of redevelopment is what is the cost? What is the performance of these proposed master plans? And so, I employed a statistical process where we projected the um, initial construction and maintenance costs of these planned stormwater interventions, as well as projected uh, the performance in terms of stormwater mitigation of these proposed systems to not only leave behind a physical plan for this community, but to have data in terms of what it costs, what it looks like, both in terms of economic, uh, economics and, and performance. And then lastly, you know, my colleague, Dr. Asia Dowden, who's in, uh, in the urban forestry department at Michigan State, um, and I have been doing work sort of exploring this issue of a hybridized approach to stormwater infrastructure. And I know that right now in the literature, because we've sort of been so focused on gray infrastructure and industrialization and urbanization over the years that once we discovered that, oh, green infrastructure, natural spaces has inherent benefits to stormwater and now the literature is exclusively pushing green infrastructure and i get it there's a need however sort of in this work that we're doing we're sort of cautioning the literature to sort of think about the limitations of green infrastructure especially in, in this time of uncertainty uh with climate change and not knowing what the characteristics of storm events might look like in terms of what systems need to kick in to manage um, for example if we have a storm that hovers over a geographic area, dropping a lot of rainfall over a long period of time, these green infrastructures hit sort of capacities and saturation points. And once it reaches that point, these green infrastructures become an impervious surface, just like concrete or anything else, right? Um, and so then what happens when they're oversaturated and we don't have any gray infrastructure? And so I think both in transition as we sort of figure out what this new normal of climate scenarios looks like, as well as um, in terms of just the reality of, you know, funding and opportunities to implement some of these things. We, we think sort of diversity in a sense of, of hybridized approaches to stormwater management is just like diversity of any kind is usually a good thing, right? Um, and so really making this argument, and uh, you know, in this feature, and then we have another piece that I'm leading that's coming out here soon in a journal of the American Water Resources Association looking at these sort of hybridized scenarios. And so in closing, what I want you all to take away is that equity in, in infrastructure includes procedural, distributive, and restorative justice. If we isolate it to one of these things um, alone, we're doing a disservice. So we have to think about, again, having folks engage in capital improvement planning and infrastructure planning um, throughout the entire process that leads to equitable distribution of these assets. And in an instance of historical inequality, injustice um, that we, we make up in, turn, in a restorative sense to address some of those issues. We also have to understand that the built environment 
uh, has to be recognized as a continuation of social circumstances. We like to think that the, phys the, the built environment sort of manifest out of the abyss, right? Um, but, you know, the built environment, again, is a human built environment. And so there are human choices and decisions that are actively made that impact sort of what exists in this built world. Um, and so I usually tell, uh, again, my students that if we want to understand sort of the quality of broader neighborhood infrastructure, we can usually look to the quality of housing, right? Um, because housing impacts tax bases that then impacts sort of improvements in terms of uh, uh, capital assets. But then if we want to understand sort of the, the, the quality of housing, we can usually look to who lives there, right? Um, in terms of uh, what people have access to. And so even in, in 2022, uh, we're actually seeing a, a, a decrease in home ownership and quality housing affordability for uh, low wealth and people of color which I can only expect will be exacerbated with this current housing market. And so we have to understand that options and choices uh, through a social lens has direct consequences for the built environment. Uh, we also have to recognize that infrastructure dynamics have direct implications in terms of risk exposure, ecological and public health outcomes in terms of water quantity and quality. And last but certainly not least, that there's an opportunity for community science, civic participation in these university community partnerships, uh, which, you know, I argue is an increasingly important pillar in both planning, uh, environmental science, public health, and science in general, and is in fact a democratic gateway to a more healthy, just, and resilient society. Um, and so thank you all very much. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I am looking forward to answering any questions that you all might have. Thank you. After, afternoon, everyone. Is that on? It's not. Oh, this one. After, no, nope, hello? Good. I mean, I'm loud, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, thank you, Dr. Hendricks, for your sure. uh, presentation today. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm ready to introduce you to our African Space Lab. Nice. Um, nice. Thank you. Um, so I'm, my research is on the opposite side of what you're doing. I'm in drinking water and I've been mm. um, looking at drinking water infrastructure, equity, access, et cetera. Um, my, I have actually two questions for you. Um, the first is, have you been conducting any, um, I guess, macro level research where you're examining different policies um, within the state and local government mm. and how they're um, promoting these inequities that you're seeing yeah. and then the second question is um have you considered tracking nipti's permit non-compliance um in those communities where you're seeing these um larger levels of, of murkier water for non-compliance for dischargers on i guess in those areas that are ej and socially vulnerable sure sure yes great question i might have to have you repeat the second question um the first question, and one, let me say that drinking water isn't sort of opposite, but complementary. And so when we think about underground water lines, um, they all run adjacent to one another and consequences for drinking water pipe infrastructure can have implications for wastewater and, and vice versa, right? Um, and so in fact, you know, we're seeing some collapses in one or the other system and making, you know, distress and collapses on the other. And so complementary. And so the other, the first question is, you know, policies and plans, you know, in terms of these issues. And yes, so in fact, one project that I mentioned, ongoing work with my colleague, Dr. Asia Dowden at Michigan State, we're actually doing a cross comparison study of urban forestry and green infrastructure plans between the state of Maryland, as well as the state of Michigan and seeing sort of how are these plans and policies written um, what do they include, especially in terms of stormwater interception and, and those types of issues. Um, and so, yeah, really sort of doing a content analysis and plan evaluation approach to understand policies, particularly when it comes to green infrastructure and urban forestry and tree canopy. Um, another project that I didn't mention is a project that we're doing in North Brentwood, Maryland, 
which is a historic black town in Maryland. And in fact, one of the first black towns established and land that was set aside for returning soldiers of color after the Civil War. And lo and behold, it was in fact the lowest lying area throughout the Anacostia River watershed that has had chronic flooding issues. And so we're doing both a contemporary analysis as well as a historic content analysis to document sort of chronic flooding and the different policies that have been implemented over the years to impact both stormwater risk as well as infrastructure risk. And, and again, I think most often we tend to focus on a cross section contemporary issues um, or making projections in light of climate change. But in my lab, we understand that, you know, we have to tell a full story of how did we even arrive at this moment in time. And I think that historic content analysis of historic documents, photos, um, policies um, throughout the state of Maryland, particularly, you know, the ones that apply to North Brentwood, Maryland, and some of the other work that we're doing to understand those dynamics, um, both historically and contemporarily. And what was the second question? I was asking if you had considered tracking NIPTI's permits non-compliance um, at the state levels, I guess, just to see if they have some overlap, if those dischargers that were sure. non-compliant are actually in those socially and EJ vulnerable, play, uh, I guess, communities that you do research in. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, great question. Um, I haven't started doing that type of work, but I do have some colleagues that are, that are doing that type of work in terms of non-compliance. And... You know, the interesting thing about that is that one of the other themes that has come out of my qualitative research with stakeholders is that we're in this we're in this moment where practitioners and policymakers are more concerned with regulatory compliance and liability than they are with the public good. Right. Um, and so, you know, a, a challenge in terms of one having the imagination to envision what a, a just or an equitable community and resilient community could look like. But then when you're only focused on litigation and making sure that you're not liable in terms of being sued, you miss the entire point and purpose of being able to fundamentally address these issues of uh, non compliance illicit discharge and so I think it's definitely a, an area where I can uh, further explore and again some of my colleagues um, their entire research program is sort of exploring the spatial distribution of non compliance illicit discharges and things like that and uh, I can sort of send along that information afterwards. Sure. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Hendricks. Oh, so I'm. Um, the work that I'm doing now is focused on environmental justice in the carceral state, and I'm just interested if you've considered, like, especially for these storm, like, raw sewage backups, like, how those are experienced in carceral spaces, and also how flooding is experienced in carceral spaces as part of your work, um, or if you know, like, how that could be better integrated into this narrative about infrastructure, and how do we not leave the most vulnerable people in carceral spaces yeah. behind in the dialogue. Right, right, right. And, and I think you're absolutely right with that last part of, of the most vulnerable amongst us, right? And so if we know that black and brown communities sort of outside of, of prison are catching hell and, and living at the margins, we know that people that are incarcerated are especially experiencing those things. Um, and, and I haven't explored sort of that in my own work, but I am familiar with some of my colleagues who do disaster scholarship and understand that one sort of, you know, incarcerated folks uh, are the most invisible and experience the most dire impacts in terms of hazard, everyday hazard exposure, as well as extreme events. But then particularly when it comes to responding to uh, fire emergencies and disasters, we employ you know, incarcerated folks to respond to some of these wildfire and other disaster events uh, and put them in these situations, but we don't we don't provide them with with proper, you know, equipment um, and health care. And then if they sort of are volunteer, if they're incarcerated folks forced to participate in these activities and uh, they don't get a chance to hang on to their certifications once they're released from prison. And so a number of sort of problematic circumstances when it comes to incarcerated folks and disaster work um, 
but yes, I, I can I can only imagine that again in terms of exposure and impact for folks in, in communities is that much worse for incarcerated folks. But I, I think that you know you're on to something that's worth exploring in term in terms of your dissertation scholarship. So thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm curious if you could talk more about how you um, approach like establishing um, like uh, interactions with communities sure. to learn from them. Is it a door to door approach? Is there yeah. meetings like um, if you're starting work in an area, how you kind of establish those connections and then hold on to them? Sure, sure, absolutely. That that's a, that's a great and important question. Um, and actually, I, I think I could I could I have a, an entirely different talk that I can give about sort of uh, the ethical considerations of community engaged scholarship and approaches to doing this work. Um, but in short, what I'll say is, is that one uh, there there has to be sort of you know genuine intent behind partnership with communities. Um, and, you know, one of my mentors, Dr. John Cooper at Texas A&M, he used to have uh, this saying that we have to develop a covenant with communities, right? In terms of what does partnership and engagement look like through their eyes in terms of what's acceptable and what's ethical, right? And we have to start there. I think, you know, in gaining entree initially to a community is really a matter of sort of you know, working your contacts and networks um, in terms of, you know, somebody knows somebody that knows somebody that could then facilitate a process when it comes to the environmental justice community and network. It's a really small community and network. And so, you know, me working with Juan Potters in Houston at, you know, uh, Tejas, Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services, him being a leader in sort of environmental justice advocacy gave me connections to folks doing EJ work in California and the Mid-Atlantic through the Carolinas and so forth and so on. And so one of the approaches, you know, the initial approach is just sort of working your contacts, people that communities trust are currently actively working with um, to address these issues. And then once you sort of make contact, um, start from the beginning, sort of taking the approach that, you know, the agenda and research opportunity has to be mutually developed from the very beginning. And so, you know, that initial conversation might be like, hi, my name is Dr. Hendricks. I'm interested in stormwater infrastructure and resilience, but I understand, especially as somebody with lived experience and the competing demands of a variety of crises and multiple issues happening at the same time, that there might be other issues that are more pertinent and important to you all right now and being open-minded to either marrying those issues with my own interests or putting my interests on a back burner um, to support them in the ways that they need supporting um, and then trying to find ways to build in the, the things that, that I'm interested in. Um, and I'll say, you know, as a doctoral student, when I, my first experience engaged in a community, it was a daunting experience because We've done community engagement so poorly and, uh, you know, in problematic ways in the past that a lot of communities don't trust uh, university folks because of the extractive science and research that we've done or the helicopter of dipping in and dipping out. And so these communities were privy to that upon my engagement. And so the first year or two of partnering with these, you know, EJ communities on the east end of inner city Houston, they wanted to test me out and, and build trust first. And so the first two years of building these relationships, I was doing pro bono work for the community in terms of writing grants for the community organization, sitting on panels for them um, over you know, a year or two until the point where I was like, okay, like this guy is serious about this work and he has a vested interest in our community. Maybe we can trust him and give him entree into the community. And so, you know, and, and and I've appreciate as daunting as it was as a doctoral student with man, I've already been in the program two years, haven't started on this, that, and the fourth. I appreciate it so much because that relationship building is absolutely critical, right? Um, and I have some other sort of principles and ethical approaches in, in, in terms of again making sure that 
it's capacity exchange and it's not one way in terms of being open to the things that the community has to offer. Um, making sure that we have a succession plan in place, right? Because you all finish your master's or PhD and move on to amazing careers. But these communities that you might be partnering with are still living through these issues every single day. And so having folks that you can tap or building an ecosystem of individuals that even though you move on, um, that you know you can sort of pass that baton to individuals that can continue that work because it's a, it's a long game in terms of addressing these environmental justice issues. And again, it's not a one-off issue or it's not sort of a, a cross-sectional issue. It's a long-term ongoing issue. And so, you know, again, working context, building trust, making sure that on the front end, you, you engage them throughout the entire process and have succession plans as people transition or you have uh, attrition on the research team are all critical things. But again, I can follow up with some of my, my list of, of ethical covenants that I include in terms of engagement and partnership. Thank you for that. Awesome, awesome. Can we give Dr. Hendricks another round of applause, please? Thank you.